Good evening. It's good to see you all tonight. Uh, just uh, make you aware as you go out, we had a little incident right here in the aisle. It's wet where this trash can's at. You just walk around. They got some stuff there to clean it up. <clears throat> but anyways, I don't remember uh, any particular announcements from this morning other than I mentioned to you, and that's in March. Well, a couple things. Uh, the first time, two weeks from tonight will be Lord's Supper. That, that is two weeks from tonight, isn't it? Yeah, thir- 20th, 27th? No, three weeks from tonight. Three weeks. Three weeks. The first Sunday night, though, we will have Lord's Supper and then our church conference business meeting will be that Wednesday night afterwards. Uh, March 27th, CMA. They're going to be here. Uh, there's about, how many did Kelly say a while ago? Probably about 14 or 15, so that'll be. Seven or eight motorcycles will come up. Uh, Jerry, you got? Did you give that to Jeremy? Jeremy, do you have the picture of Sherry got her motorcycle? Do you, can you can you show everybody her motorcycle? Well, Jim gave it. This came from Jim. <laughs> okay. Uh, you ate like that. You know what I was talking about. So I was like, oh, okay. She does have a motorcycle. Uh, but no, uh, that would be on the 27th. Uh, and then I've told them that they're, they're looking forward to coming. Some of them have been to Sweet Teas before. And so we're going to go out to eat at Sweet Teas afterwards. So anybody and everybody wants to tag along, ride along, motorcycle or car. All right. Uh, those are those are the announcements to know about. Uh, a couple names were added to the prayer list this morning. Debbie Weinhammer uh, and David Davis were added. Uh, are there any other updates? All right. Well, if there's none others, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we once again come before you tonight and thank you that we have the privilege of coming into your presence. That. Uh, as the writer in Hebrews says, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And Father, I thank you for that through Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask your blessings upon this time tonight that you would speak to us through your word. And uh, Lord, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ray. If anybody wants to help us, come on up here. But if you don't, let's all stand and sing, Jesus Saves.
All right, take your Bibles and look with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. Finish up this first chapter in Philippians. Again, uh, Warren Wiersbe, who I, uh, I love Wiersbe's commentaries. If you're a teacher and you don't have a commentaries, you can get his. They're not that expensive, but they're very good because he's very devo devotionally minded, if you will. Uh, but, but he's down to earth. Uh, he puts the cookies on the bottom shelf where you, can, where you can reach them. I've got some commentaries that when I read them, I'm thinking, huh? <laughs> I'm like, I, I, you know. Anyways, uh, but Warren Wiersbe said this. Uh, I want to just read you this quote as I get ready to read Scripture in a mo moment. We're going to be in Philippians 1, 27 through 30. But listen to what uh, Dr. Wiersbe says. He said, the Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. We are sons in the family enjoying the fellowship of the gospel. We saw that in uh, these first 11 verses. And then he says we are servants sharing in the furtherance of the gospel. That's what we looked in verses 12 through 26. And then tonight we're going to see that we're also soldiers defending the faith of the gospel. And the believer with a single mind can have the joy of the Holy Spirit even in the midst of the battle. We are in a battle for truth. And for God's word, we need to stand firm, as I talked about this morning. So if you are there in Philippians 1, stand with me. I'm going to read in verses 27 through 30 of Philippians 1. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. You may be seated. And let's go to the Lord in prayer once more. Father, we ask your blessings upon this time tonight. Speak to us through your word. Encourage our hearts. Encourage our walk. May we seek to, to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Paul says here as he is picking this up, as we are looking at this, he says here, only let your conversation, the King James says, that's your conduct. He's not talking about your speech. Although, let me just say this, we need to be careful about our speech. There are other texts that deal specifically with uh, our speech and how we talk. Jesus warned us that for every idle word that men may speak, we'll give an account in the day of judgment. But the word conversation here is better translated conduct. Only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ or worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he talks about, he says there at the end of verse 27, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. The faith of the gospel uh, is divine truth. And what is the gospel? Paul tells us, sums it up in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the great chapter on resurrection, the resurrection. But he says in 1 Corinthians 15, I want to read verses 1 through 4. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, unto you which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. But which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the faith of the Gospel right there, that Jesus died for our sins, and that He was buried, and that He was bodily resurrected. And he's now ascended to the right hand of the Father where the writer in Hebrews tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for us. He calls your name uh, in the Father's ear. That's the imagery that he gives there, that he is seated at the Father's right hand and that, that he intercedes for us. John says in 1 John 2 that he is our advocate, one who pleads our cause and, uh, and our case. But not only is he our advocate, he is a propitiation for us. And that's a big word, but it means it's the satisfaction of God's righteous requirement uh, for our sin. He satisfied God's wrath by his perfect sinless life. And so the, the faith of the gospel, Jude 3, 
Uh, and Jude's only one chapter. It's like Philemon. Uh, there's only one chapter. But in Jude, verse 3, it says there, we were reminded to contend earnestly for the, for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. There are many that uh, want to water down the gospel. They want to water down the Bible. They want to explain it away. They want to talk about what culture is and what culture says and how we need to, to bend Scripture to culture. No, we don't. Scripture doesn't bend. It'll break every culture that tries to bend it because the Word of God will stand. Cultures come and go. And uh, just quite honestly, we're living in a day that looking around the room, with the exception of uh, Ava and Abby back there, most of us in, the, in this room 30 years ago never imagined where we'd be at as a nation where we're at right now. Now, you can talk about the homosexual issue, but you just look at not only that, you look at the other uh, issues and the, the rise of what they call the nuns, people who have no religious affiliation, I mean, they, they, they may not call themselves atheist, but they don't have any religious affiliation. That number is rising dramatically, and it is it's getting higher and higher. And we need to, we need to uh, be gossiping, if you will, the gospel, sharing the gospel with others. And we need to contend for the gospel. In 1 Timothy uh, 4, verse 1, Paul said there that the, the days will come. In the latter days, there will be many who depart from the faith. We need to make sure we know what we believe. And we need, to, we need to believe what we know. But we need to know that we, what it is that we believe and what the, what the Scripture says. And we don't need, need to try and expl explain away some of the tough passages that we have trouble understanding sometimes. You get into Judges and there's some things where the guy made the, uh, I don't remember his name, he made the vow about the first thing he saw coming out of his tent and it was his daughter that he was sacrificed. There's things that you look at and you say, how do you explain that? Well, first off, tonight, that's not what I'm going to deal with. I'm going to leave that for Brother Wesley the next time he preaches to expound that text. <laughs> but seriously, we need to, to contend for the faith. In 1 Timothy 1.11, Paul talked about the faith that was given to him, that was committed to him by the Lord. And then he says in 1 Timothy 6.20, he then committed that faith to, to Timothy. He passed it on to Timothy. And he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the, the second letter he was writing to him, to commit that faith to faithful men who would then continue to share. And so what we teach, we, when we teach God's Word, uh, Steve and Stevie, our teachers, I like that, Steve and Stevie. Uh, but anyways, I digress. I'll get off on a rabbit trail there. We need to make sure we're teaching the gospel. And staying true to the Word of God. And I believe you are. And our, our children's teachers and our youth teachers, we need to make sure that we're staying for that. And Paul just talks about that. And we live in a time where there are those who, again, as I've said, want to explain away the gospel. So we need to realize that we need to fight the good fight of faith. And it's a spiritual battle. Uh, Paul talked about this in 1 Timothy 6, 12. Uh, he, uh, described it, he called it like this, if I can get over there. Uh, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, uh, wherein thou, thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And so he says, fight the good fight of faith. Understand it's a spiritual battle, and because it's a spiritual battle, it's not a, it's, while we see people face to face, we think sometimes that, listen, you are my problem. Our, our weapons, it's a spiritual battle that we fight. And we need to understand it. And what it is, we see someone physically and we think, well, you're my problem. When really it's a spiritual issue that's going on. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians, uh, Ver, uh, chapter 10, he said in verses 3 through 6, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And when he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that means that they're not fleshly. Okay? He says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge or to punish 
All disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I mentioned this morning in, about Ephesians 6, about standing and about putting on the gospel armor and to, that we're to stand. Realize that the faith is worth defending. And we, apologetics, uh, if you've ever heard that term in regard to the faith, apologetics is not apologizing. It is the defense of the faith. It's, it's saying why what we believe is, is reasonable, why it is biblical, uh, and that, that's just defending it. And you and I need to be prepared to defend what we believe. Peter says always be ready to give an answer uh, to those who ask you. Basically, I'm paraphrasing, but those who ask you why you believe what you believe. Be prepared to speak up and say, you know, I follow Jesus Christ. And while it may not make sense to you, he's my Lord. He died for me. And because he di died for me, I'm going to live for him. And I'm going to follow him. Now, I want you to know, I don't do that perfectly. I, I don't do that. I, it's not that I don't ever make mistakes or I don't ever sin. I do. And so you tell people, look, I'm not better than you. I just want you to know, I follow Christ. That's why I do. Be ready to give defense. And so in this, <coughs> excuse me, in this battle, there, uh, there's three things I want you to remember we need to, to have. First off, we need to have consistency. We need to be consistent. There are too many Christians that are hot and cold, up and down, left or right. You, you can call it whatever you want to, but too many believers that... We just need to be consistent. We need to be persistent. And, and so we need to have repetition. In other words, we need to repeat what it is. People, you know, uh, I remember when I first began pastoring my first church, uh, and I don't remember how long it was I'd been there, but there was a lady in the church. I love her to death. I really do. She is a special lady. Uh, but whatever came up, came out with her. And one Sunday I got up to preach and I, I said what the text was. And what, she said, oh, we heard that before. And I hadn't preached that message before. And she, but she said, oh, we done heard that one before. I said, well, you need to hear it again. I don't know if I said that out loud, but I certainly thought it. You know, uh, there, there are those that we need to make sure that we're being consistent in our walk. Being steady. Isaiah uh, says this, and it's a, a, a passage that you're familiar with. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31. He says, He giveth power to the faint, and to, them, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You see there's a progression there. You know, when you first got saved, man, you fired up. You, man, you, you're like soaring with the eagles. But then, you know, you've been there a while, and in the Baptist church, the Cold Water Committee locates you and says, hey, you need to, you need to cool off there a little bit. You need to settle down. You know, uh, it's like a guy uh, that I work with at Republic. I saw him Monday when he was getting our garbage. He said, oh, I got to tell you one. He's always wanting to tell you funny he heard on the radio. He said this fellow went to this, this church and, and as Andy tells the joke to me he's like it's a Baptist church you know because he's not he's Wesleyan or whatever not this Wesleyan but, but he's Wesleyan <laughs> over out of Hortense I didn't think about that until I said it but anyways he said this guy was down there on the front row and the preacher was preaching and boy he just he just shouted and everybody kind of looked at him you know and uh so he sat there and the preacher kept, kept preaching. He shouted again and everybody kind of looked at him. And finally, the third time he, he shouted amen when the preacher was preaching. Deacon's nothing. This is his, his joke, so get mad at him. He said one of the deacons got up. We'll say the ushers come down to him and said, uh, excuse me, sir. Said, you're not from here, are you? He said, no. He said, well, we just noticed you've been kind of shouting while the preacher was preaching. It's kind of you know, disturbing everybody. He said, well, I, I just, I can't help it. I got religion. He said, well, you didn't get it here, so be quiet. <laughs> we, you know, uh, listen, we need to, we don't always have to be on fire. But when, we need to have a consistency in our walk. And being honest, you know, sometimes it's like this, isn't it? 
And what we want to do is, is, is kind of level it out. We don't want to have some highs, to, to, you know. Listen, we all like the mountaintops, but let me just tell you this. The mountaintop experiences are for you to go back down in the valley and to help somebody else. It's not, we're not made to live up there on the mountaintops. The air's too thin, it's too cold. All, you can use all those things about thinking about being on the mountaintop, but it's down in the valley where you gotta walk, okay? And th that's what we need. We need to be persistent. We need to have repetition. We need to, do the, we need to read our Bibles. We need to spend time reading the Word of God. And it's not so much the quantity of what you read, is it do you pay attention while you read it? We need to pray. We need to share our faith. We need to serve. They're just, we need to be faithful. And so we need, there needs to be consistency in what we do. And why do we do that? Why should, why should we remember this? Well, Paul will tell us later. We see here in Philippians 3.20, he says here, and, and see, the King James says, for our conversation is in heaven. That word there is not conduct. It's citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's what the word literally means, citizenship. Uh, he says, for us, remember, as Paul wrote to the Philippians from a prison cell, as he writes back to them, talking about being joyful, and he's talking to Roman, to Roman citizens who are proud of their citizenship. He says in this third chapter, for our citizenship is in heaven, from, which, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body or this lowly body. Uh, we're citizens of heaven. We need to act like it. If you've ever been overseas and seen some Americans that, that were acting badly, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, because, you know, people come to America and they talk about how friendly Americans are. But it's amazing when Americans go overseas how they talk about Americans. Because a lot of times Americans, when they, when they go overseas, we, listen, when you go to another country, you're not in America anymore. You're under that country's laws. And you're in a different, they have different customs and different cultures. And I just tell you this, humor is different in other places. And so you just need to understand that. And understand this, that this is not our home. We are pilgrims passing through on our way home. Because our citizenship is in heaven. And it will help us if we remember that our citizenship is in heaven it will help us to be more consistent in our walk. And so when he says there, uh, only let your conduct, your walk, uh, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Paul says that back in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The way we walk. I remember walking in the garden behind my grandfather. My grandfather was bow-legged. And I mean, he walked with his feet turned out, and, you know, and so I'd have to turn my feet out, Wesley, to step into his footprints in that dirt as I walked behind him as he had a little hand plow, and he'd plow his garden, and I would walk in his steps. We are to walk in the steps of Jesus. We are to have a walk worthy of him. Paul talked about just a couple of pages in your Bible over in Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. He said that ye might walk worthy of of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, that ye might walk worthy. In other words, don't walk, do not conduct yourselves in a way that you would not if Jesus were standing physically in front of you at that moment. Now then, Anybody, anybody fail there? I have. Don't talk the way you wouldn't talk if Jesus were there. You ever failed there? You know when I talked a minute ago about every idle word? Man, I got a lot of idle words. But it's not about beating us up. It's just encouraging us to get up and start moving. See, it doesn't matter where you're at right now. It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters is the direction you're headed. And let me just tell you this. You may have walked off into the woods for a while. That's the term I use to talk about walking away from Jesus. It's just as 
far back to Jesus as it is, ever how far away you walked, it's as far back, okay? But there's a difference. And here's the difference. When you turn around, you're walking with Jesus. He'll walk with you out of those woods. I mean, he doesn't just stand out there and say, oh, come on, come on, you can make it, come on, a little further. You'll find that he will walk with you. As I mentioned this morning, God ain't the one that's moved, it's us. And so we need to be consistent in our walk with Christ. Someone wrote this little poem, I don't know who it is, you can't give them, so I can't give them credit, but they said this. They said, you are writing a gospel, a chapter each day by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithful or true. Just what is the gospel according to you? You see, you really, you practice what you believe. People say, well, I don't care what you believe as long as you, you know, you just act all right. Well, your, what your belief determines your behavior. And bad belief will result in bad behavior. You can mark it down. So we need to be consistent, but we also need to cooperate. We need to cooperate with one another. He says here, only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I got to get me some water. I got COVID throat. I don't have COVID right now, but those of you who have had it, you know what I'm talking about. And he says there that, you, that we're working together. That we stand fast in one spirit with one mind. That don't mean we just are in lockstep. But we realize we have a common uh, faith. We have a common goal that is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our goal. And so we work together. And he says, with one spirit, with one mind, striving together. Working together. This is what that, that phrase, striving together, uh, a Greek word that I can't pronounce, so no, I can't pronounce it, but it means, it's, it's where we get our English word, athletics. I thought it was interesting that that's where we're at tonight. We deal with that word. Why? What's happening tonight? The Super Bowl. Now you say, well, who's going to win? I don't know. I'm not a, a prognosticator. I know who I'm going to pull for, but... That team, both of those teams, they have to work together for a common goal. Both teams want to win the Super Bowl, but both teams can't win the Super Bowl. It's just like if you, if you want to take a, a NASCAR analogy, if you like NASCAR, that driver cannot win a race by himself. He's got to have a pit crew that can get out there and change those tires and fuel that car up and, do, and clean his windshield. I'll do that under eight seconds. It takes a team, and they work together. We, to further the gospel and to defend the faith, we've got to not only be consistent, but we've got to cooperate with one another. We've got to work together. We don't all have the same job. We don't all have the same gifts, but we work together for the advancement of the gospel. God has gifted us and, and placed us in the body for a purpose. And so we cooperate together, knowing that, listen, I can't, I can't sing. I can read music, and I, I know what's, what sounds good. And that sounds weird when I say I can't sing. I, I, I can't sing and sound good. But because I was in the band, I, I know how to read music, and, I, and I, I know when somebody's flat or when somebody's sharp. Uh, I understand those things. And there's times in the church we may get a little flat or a little sharp, if you will, with one another. We get a little bit of out, out of tune with each other. And we need to be reminded that we cooperate. We work together for the good of the gospel, for the advancement of the gospel, for the faith of the gospel that Paul has talked about here. It's the, the word, I mean, you use harmony, where we, we, come, we work together for others. And Paul just says here, that's what we are to do. Remember, earlier in this chapter, he talked about those that were preaching Christ out of jealousy or envy. He said, I don't care. As long as Christ is being preached, I don't care who gets the credit. And I, if you remember, I told you three weeks ago, what could we do if nobody cared who got the credit for what got done? Imagine. If nobody cared. You know, because Jesus sees what we're doing. So we want to be consistent, but we want to cooperate together. And then finally in verses 28 through 30, he finishes this out. 
We want to have confidence. Look what he says here. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, we're always going to have those that oppose us. Listen, here in the United States, so far, really, we ain't faced any persecution. You ain't been persecuted. You might have been made fun of. Somebody might have mocked you. They might have laughed at you. And they said, oh, they're a goody two-shoes. They might have called you a name. But you haven't been persecuted. You haven't been beaten. You haven't been drug out of this church because you're, you're in a church. We haven't had that building burned down around us or our building burned down because we are a church. But there are believers today in the world that experience that. There are believers, brothers and sisters in Christ in China who happen to meet secretly. China has a church that it recognizes but there's, a, there's a, a church that is growing there in China that the government in China has found out they cannot stop. See, the, the, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, the disciples after Jesus' uh, ascension back into heaven, they thought they could tell Peter and John and the other disciples to be silent and they could squash it. But they refused to be silent. Peter looked at them and said, when they told him not to, then we... Tell you not to speak in this man, man's name, in the name of Jesus. He said, whether it's right inside a man of God, you decide. We can't, we can't do nothing but speak what we've heard and seen. We've got to tell. And so we're going to face persecution. But I, mean, I can tell you this. Whether or not you and I live long enough to see it, I believe my grandchildren will. If things do not change, it's coming to this country. Do you know that Christianity is growing faster on the African continent than it is in the United States? It used to be that we sent missionaries to Africa. Before long, if things don't change, we'll have to be getting missionaries sent from Africa to the United States. And you think about it. Our faith, I mentioned about the rise of the nuns. Young people. Ages 18 to 27, that is the fastest, fastest growing group in that category. That they have no affiliation with churches. Sarah can tell you, Greg can tell you this. I mean, it's, this, this data is out there. I'm not telling you something that's secret. This, there's research been done on this. Take a look around tonight. In this room, under the age of 50, under, I'm just looking around. Right now, right now, we got three people that I, I believe are under the age of, Sarah, you ain't 50. And Abby and Abel, Abel, Abel is not, well, okay, up there. In, I wasn't looking up there. So we got six. Jacob's not up there, is he? Oh, seven, okay. That ought to be concerning. Where are we headed? If we don't see young people, if we don't reach young people, listen, we don't, we don't forget about the seniors. I mean, we're the ones that need to be leading the way. And so understand persecution, he says here, having confidence and nothing terrified by your adversaries. And I, let me just say, I, I, I didn't understand this verse a lot, but I have a better understanding of it now than I did. It said, which is to them an evident token of perdition? I always wondered about that. But that's just, that's just proof of their damnation, that they are not followers of Christ because they are persecuting those who follow the Lord, because they are persecuting those who believe the word. That's just proof to them, of the, that's just proof and uh, evidence of their damnation that they are not following Christ, that they resist him. And Jesus told us not to be surprised. He said, when they reject you, it's because they rejected me. And if they rejected him, what do you think they're going to do to us? Uh, and it's not us they reject and listen, if you share your faith with somebody and they don't believe it, you don't, don't, don't take your shoes off, smack them and say, oh, I ain't going to talk to them no more. Because as long as they're drawing breath, God ain't through with them yet. There is still the potential for God to do something in their lives. It may take 
Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. But don't ever give up until God either takes them off your heart or God takes them out of this world. You share with them. But he says, it's proof that they're unbelievers. But he said, but to you, that the fact that you're persecuted, he said, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, let's just be honest. Who, who, who wants to step up to the front of the line and say, I want to suffer? Yeah, give me some more suffering. I mean, we could sit in church and say, oh, yeah, I'll suffer for Jesus. I'm willing to suffer. None of us really are looking for that. But he says here, it's been, not only has it been given us the privilege, he says, to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. This is what the Bible talks about. Uh, Jesus uh, talked about in Matthew uh, chapter 10. He said there, uh, beginning around verse 16. He said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour which ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the serpent as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of, the, of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather... Fear him which is able to destroy both body, both soul and body in hell. So persecution, they kill you. What have they done? Andy Brum, who is, he's been dead now for a number of years, was an evangelist. But before God saved him, he was a drug user, alcoholic. And one night he went in to rob a store. And he went in and he put a gun up to the clerk's head and said, give me all the money or I'll blow your head off. The clerk just looked back at him and said, instant death, instant glory. He said, what? I said, give me all the money or I'll blow your head off. She said, instant death, instant glory. Andy Brown said, I wasn't anticipating that. He said, I was not expecting that. I didn't know how to deal with that. He said, I turned around and walked out of the store with a gun in my hand and no money. Because a clerk who was a believer in Christ just looked me straight in the eye and said, instant death, instant glory. She said, basically, I ain't afraid to die. I don't know if he ever went back and met her. I don't know when it was he got saved. But he said, that's one of the things that God used to grip his heart was someone who was not afraid to die. We'll face that. In Acts 5, verse 41, the, Peter and John, after they had been beaten, they had earlier been warned and let go. But you find there in chapter 5 where the, the Sanhedrin has them arrested again, detained. They have them beaten this time. And they go back to the other disciples, and what do they do? They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' name. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not, looking at, I'm not looking to go out and be beaten, somebody to beat me. But if they tell me you can't preach anymore, what if, they, what if the government comes down and says you can't, you can't preach that anymore? Hmm? They're going to have to do what they're going to have to do because I'm going to have to do what I have to do. I'm not just going to go out and, and preach something just to agitate. But listen, when I come to it in Scripture, I'm going to deal with it. And the government can like it or the government can lump it. 
And it's easy to say that now. But the day, the day will probably come. Because they're already trying, they're already doing this up in Canada. Yeah, and so we'll see it here. 2 Timothy 3.12. Paul tells us there, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 3, Peter tells us there, he says, and just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all the verses, but beginning around uh, verse 13, he says, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. If you suffer for righteousness' sake. Listen, we don't want to be persecuted because we're jerks. There's a difference. Okay? But if we're persecuted because we're following Christ, yeah, and he just, he goes on, he says, uh, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. He goes over into chapter 4. He says, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. He said, I'm telling you, these things are coming. And so, as believers, we want to be consistent in our walk. We want to cooperate together but we can have confidence. And when we have that confidence, we'll cooperate and we'll be consistent. I mean, it, it just flows. And, and so Paul says here, let me read these three verses, these four, actually four verses again. Only let your conversation, your, your conduct, your walk, be as it becometh the gospel or worthy of the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is, this is one of my goals, one of my desires, is that when somebody comes down here and they visit at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, when they go away, they say, I don't know much about what they believe, but one thing I know, those people love one another. And it's evident that they love one another, and when we love one another, we'll be able to love them as well, okay? But that we love one another. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. But so stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together, working together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which to them is evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. So we want to be consistent, we want to cooperate together, and we want to be confident in our walk with Christ. Now we're going to have struggles and battles and suffering, three things. It proves that we're believers, it's a privilege, and it's experienced by other believers. See, you know what Satan wants you to think? When you're going through something, you're the only one going through that. Nobody else knows what you're going through. Nobody else has ever experienced what you're experiencing. You're the only person who's ever lived on the face of the universe who's ever experienced what you're going through right now. And that's a lie. You know why he does that? What is 1 Peter 5? How does he, what does he call Satan there? He's like a what? A roaring lion. I love, Jan don't like these shows. I like to watch them. I don't, I don't watch them a lot as much as I used to. But you ever notice how a leopard or a lion or a cheetah, what do they do? Are the hyenas or the wolves? The hunters. They call out the weak. They isolate. And when they isolate, they attack and devour. That's what Satan wants you to think. He wants you to think, well, nobody else knows what I'm going through. There's other believers going through what you're going through. There's strength. And let me just say this. While you may sometimes be ashamed of what you're going through, don't be. You know, the church ought to be a place where we can come to and we can share with one another and say, look, I'm... Would you pray with me? I, now, let me just say this. You don't always have to share all the details. But you can say, would you pray with me? I'm struggling with some things. I just need you to pray with me. You say, well, how do you want me to pray? Just pray. God knows what I'm struggling with. I just need you to pray. But I'm having some struggles. And without, without you know, if Jim come to me and said, brother, would you just pray for me? I'm, I'm struggling with some things. And, and I look at him and say, well, struggling? Why are you struggling? And this, you, you have your best life now. No, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what Joel Osteen says. Your best life ain't now. 
best life is to come with Jesus. But if he comes to me and says, hey, I'm struggling. We need to pray with him. We need to encourage one another. We need to pray with one another because we all are going through this together. That's the cooperation part. We need to be consistent in our walk, but we need to cooperate with one another and we have confidence because we're in Christ. That's what Paul says we're to do. All right, with that being said, would you stand and let's pray. Father, help us. Lord, help me to be more consistent in my walk because, Father, the simple truth is I'm not near as consistent as I would like to be, as I need to be, as I should be. And yet, Father, I pray that we may not sense that shame, but, Lord, that we may sense that you are calling us home to you. You are calling us to walk with you, to follow you, to obey you. Father, I pray that you would help us to be found faithful followers of Christ and let your name be glorified in our lives and in this, your church. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a terrific week. I hope it's the best week you've had yet. You ain't had this week yet, so I hope it's a good week. And I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. We'll be back. We'll be in Deuteronomy Wednesday night on our Bible as we go through the books of the Bible. So 7 o'clock Wednesday night. Look forward to seeing you then. Anything else before we dismiss, close out tonight? All right, Steve Boyette, will you close us out with prayer, please, sir?